Cool. Uh, yeah, hello. Welcome, everyone. We'll get started. Um, keep everything moving. We've got a lot to get through. Um, so thank you for coming along. Um, this is my talk on Cert Manager and how we are moving everyone from Cube Lego and uh, yeah, going over some of the new features, our roadmap, and showing some of this off and the history of it all. So first of all, um, yeah, who am I? I've got a big blank white space there. I think I was meant to put some text there. Um, so I've been working on Kubernetes extensions now for quite a long time. Um, as you'll see, I've been using Kubernetes for a few years, and I work with Jetstack um, as a solutions engineer, which means I'm helping customers achieve their goals with Kubernetes to keep it generic. Um, who are Jetstack? We're a UK-based remote company. Um, we're a consultancy that help enterprises and large companies uh, moving over to Kubernetes um, and adopting um, all of this new cloud-native technology uh, that you see out there, and also building little tools to obviously ease the pain, such as this. Um, so what is Cert Manager? First, I think I always, first of all, some history. Um, Cube Lego. So who here has used Cube Lego? Cool. Nice. Um, yeah, so Cube Lego was one of the first Cube like, uh, external Kubernetes controllers. I think, this is me off the top of my head, but I think the only one before there was one of the actual ingress controllers, something like the Nginx ingress controller. Um, it was made a very long time ago, I think nearly three years now, uh, by Christian, who's sitting over here. Um, and yeah, it, was, it kind of solved one problem, one problem only. People wanted to get TLS certificate signed from Let's Encrypt, the new service where you get your free TLS. Um, and it's seemingly used absolutely everywhere, um, from what I've seen. Um, the Prowl, so if you ever submit any code to Kubernetes and you go and check to see how those tests ran, um, Prowl secures its endpoints with Kubelego. Uh, I think Kates.io, or at least parts of it, is. Um, and many other organizations, including yourselves. And um, yeah, we've had 20 million image pools, although it says 10 million plus there. That's just Docker Hub's not being particularly accurate. Um, but yeah, we've had 20 million image pools over the years now, um, seemingly only eight stars, but maybe that's just a reflection of how people use Docker Hub. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, it's become huge, and it's been a very successful project. But obviously, with a lot of people using it, there's a lot to do, there's a lot to support. Um, this is a little funny extra slide I added in last night. So if you look, this is in 2016, so maybe it's only two years old. I take that back. Um, this is Christian at the top in March saying he's just gotten started on doing this. Um, this is before I knew Christian or Jetstack or anything, and I happen to have gotten started on my own, um, which is Acme Secrets or Cube Acme. Um, don't go and use it now. It's, I spent way too long fixing small bugs and not enough time fixing the big ones. Uh, but it was just, funnily enough, we happened to have started work on a very similar project at the same time, and now we work together and we're doing it all again. Um, so, yeah. So, Cert Manager, on the other hand, um, is trying to build out more of a general purpose certificate management platform for Kubernetes. So, there's lots of pain points in Kubernetes. One of them definitely is TLS. Um, not just on the edge, but between services, um, securing core system components. There's a lot to it. Um, and beyond that, if you look at a traditional organization, they have quite a lot of different policies for how you can go and get your certificates. You might have to send emails to your CA team if it's at worst. I've heard some real, real horror stories. Um, and we want to try and improve that. Uh, and we want to do that via Kubernetes because people are using Kubernetes. There's a lot of primitives there, especially with all these extension API servers and so on. Um, so we want to be looking uh, at building out further to being able to do things like revocation of certificates, auditing who's requesting them, uh, policy as to who can request them as well, and different separation of concerns. You know, who are your admins who decide these things, and who are your developers who just need to consume certificates? What does your organization say is the max length of time that a certificate should be valid for? And so on. And we're trying to really provide an abstraction over all of the wide variety of CAs out there. So we're moving beyond just Let's Encrypt um, to support other issuers too. And this is kind of 
the line. I think, similar to how we have storage class and so on, I think we can almost introduce something like a certificate class. So I want a publicly trusted certificate, and the definition of that can be different depending on the actual environment you're deployed into. This is further down the line. So currently, we support Acme, um, Let's Encrypt, which is obviously a bit of a given. We had to support that in order to uh, ever provide any kind of a alternative. Um, we have CA support, so this is load up a simple signing key pair into the API server, and Cert Manager will manage that CA for you. It will sign, renew, issue certificates, and you get all of the niceties that you get with anything else just with your simple signing key, CA key pair. And that's very useful as a building block um, for a number of other things, too. And as of yesterday, if anyone's got a very keen eye on the repository, I merged in Vault support, which uh, was added by a uh, contributor who spent the last couple of months putting this together. Um, so a big thank you to him, uh, Vides Chardins. Um, yeah. Uh, so, if anyone wants to, if anyone does use HashiCorp Vault and they want to start issuing certificates from there, you can now do that and give it a go. It's early experimental support, but we'll work on it. And this kind of, to me, shows that we can support more than just Let's Encrypt. This isn't just a one one controller problem, um, and that's kind of really trying to push this general purpose certificate management side of things. It's not just about securing your ingresses anymore. So, yeah, we integrate with multiple CAs. Um, we have structured API types now, so anyone who's used Cube Lego will know you have one way to interact with it, and it's through adding an annotation. Um, just, you know, secure this, which is great. Um, it's really nice and simple, but as soon as you need a bit more flexibility, it's not quite there. So, for example, a big feature request is DNS validation support in Cube Lego for Acme. And to be honest, it was very difficult for us to add in a clean way that would allow you to be dynamic enough between different domains to do this. Um, and there's a number of other issues, but yeah. We didn't have the configuration service surface that we needed in order to add the features we wanted. So by doing this, yeah, we get more advanced configuration. And in future, too, we can actually maintain that API um, through conversions and so on. So when it comes to new versions of Cert Manager coming out, even if that breaks the API schema, we can migrate people and help them out with that. So a very brief one versus the other. This is a table pulled straight from the docs. Um, configuration, you know, you've got annotations versus CRDs. Uh, CAs, Cube Lego will only ever support Acme. Um, oh, this needs updating to include Vault now as well, as I said, it was merged yesterday. Um, in terms of actual support for Kubernetes, we have only validated Kubelego up to Kubernetes 1.8. Um, may or may not work beyond there. I don't want to stand on stage and say it, because then I'll be on the hook to continue to support that further. We really do believe that Cert Manager is where you should be moving to. Um, and obviously, as you'll see in this talk, we've tried to make that migration as seamless as possible. So it is possible for you. Debugging and the likes, um, anyone that's used Cube Lego has probably at some point also looked at the logs for Cube Lego to work out what is going on. I personally, I believe you shouldn't really need to look at the logs unless something catastrophic is happening. If you've got a problem with your deployment, your autoscaler, it's rare you go and look at Cube Controller Manager's <coughs> logs. You tend to just describe an object, look at the events API. There are Kubernetes systems in place for this, and we want to be using those. Um, and you'll see soon we've got much better support for things like multi-tenancy, so having various different teams, each with their own, say, Acme accounts or Vault servers or Vault PKI backends or whatever else. Um, yeah, and one big one, if anyone who's tried to use Cube Lego with anything other than a GCE or Nginx ingress controller is we have pretty universal support for ingress controllers now um, through a few optimizations in kind of that code path. So that's quite a big win. Um, it saves having so many questions on how do I get this there and this there. Um, we don't have to have a hard-coded list of names like we do in Cube Lego. So yeah, why do this as well? Um, there are many ways to get certificates. You can just kubectl create secret, um, and that's fine. But it's, you know, it's manual. It's, pr it's very cumbersome. Um, renewal is a calendar event or something. It's not really ideal. Um, if you want to integrate with something like Vault, 
anyone who's tried that, you'll be in adding custom init containers, uh, sidecars and things. And again, you need to start thinking about making sure these things are up to date, uh, making sure that they're requesting the right types of certificate. And Vault does have some support for this, but it's not generally, like across all of these different CAs, it's not generally consumable and easy to specify. Um, yeah, or you can directly embed like the CA um, API, I suppose, into your application, but no one really wants to be doing that, I don't think. Um, and then, yeah, Cube Lego, Cube Cert Manager, obviously. So, yeah, custom resources have been very, very uh, useful for us. They've allowed us to actually abstract away all of the details of these CAs, and we provide that translation now. You say you want a certificate that looks like this, it's then up to us to go and negotiate that and do whatever else in order to get that. Um, we can report back any problems back to you, and so on. By doing it, um, and you'll see soon with some of the new resource types we've introduced, it means you can actually have a uh, multi-tenant environment where different people request different certificates from different places, and you can use the likes of RBAC to restrict who can actually reference certain types of issuers uh, through kind of standardized Kubernetes things like namespaces. So having an issuer constrained to a single namespace. You'll see soon. Um, and yeah, by doing it this way, instead of having this embedded you know, all, over your, uh, all over your system, all over your deployment, it can all be managed centrally. So now you know when you've got a problem with certificates, you do a kubectl describe certificates, maybe with all namespaces on there. Um, and you can get a brief overview of everything. And if you've got problems, you can have Prometheus metrics, you can have Prometheus alerts, you can have all sorts to actually alert you of these things beforehand. And you can do it, integrate it all with your standard alerting flow, however you like. Um, and yeah, that's with the addition of the Prometheus metrics endpoint in there, and also the likes of cube state metrics that can go and inspect the contents of an API server and expose that all as metrics. So yeah, I keep on about this multi-tenancy and things. So going through some of these resource types that we have, we have issuers and cluster issuers. And this to us is the representation of a CA in Kubernetes. So by doing this, instead of Previously with Cube Lego, if you wanted to switch from, say, a Let's Encrypt staging to Let's Encrypt production endpoint, you would update a flag on Cube Lego. And if you wanted to support both, I mean, you'd struggle. Um, I think maybe some people run two instances of Cube Lego. It, things can happen. Um, and it's not ideal, really. It's not designed for this sort of thing. It was very simple. We need to get certificates from Let's Encrypt for this ingress. By doing it this way too, you can actually have your organization or administrators define these issuers, so all your developers need to say is, I want a certificate. They don't need to think about where that comes from, be that VeriSign, Let's Encrypt, or whatever else. They say, give me a certificate, and they get a signed certificate if that kind of certificate is valid or acceptable within your organizational policies. So there's a lot around policy that we're going to be building out. Um, I think a lot of it, yeah, you'll see soon. And certificates then reference these issuers in order to obtain certificates from them. And that will look something like this, um, in the simplest case, with a CA issuer. So we define it. This is within a single namespace. So this issuer can only be used by other tenants in the default namespace. Um, and here we're just referencing a simple signing key pair. So Cert Manager will now use this key pair to sign and issue certificates when a certificate references it. Um, there is an equivalent uh, cluster issuer resource type, similar to how we have roles and cluster roles. You have cluster issuers, which apply across the whole cluster. Um, and that's kind of because a lot of users do just want you know, to access Let's Encrypt production. Not everyone's running huge multi-tenant environments with many teams and this, that, and the other. So we do support that. And uh, yeah, you often see someone creating something like a Let's Encrypt prod cluster issuer. Here it's a namespaced one. but it's the same sort of thing, um, or a Let's Encrypt staging one that applies cluster-wide to kind of provide Let's Encrypt as a service to the users of your cluster. And you can see here in the Acme case, we define the Acme server that we want to use, your email address, and then a reference to um, where we store the private key. So you can migrate your accounts across if you need to from Cube Lego. And we have that documented in our migration guide. And then, We've only got an example of HTTP 01 here, but you'll see DNS 01 too. Um, we can enable different kinds of providers as well, which is kind of allowing user to use HTTP validation or DNS validation or 
as you'll see, say your organization's Cloudflare account. So now you don't need your developers to go and add TXT records to validate things. Cert Manager still does that for you, but they also never get the opportunity to even get access to the, those API keys because it's sensitive. You can't put your necessarily a Cloud DNS administrator account um, in the hands of everyone within your organization. So, yeah, certificates. So certificates represent um, a certificate request within Kubernetes, and they reference issuers or cluster issuers in order to retrieve the certificates from that source. So that has fields like DNS names, key usages, although that's a pull request still, um, and a number of other fields. It's kind of representing the whole CSR eventually. Um, and Cert Manager can then go along, convert that into an actual CSR, perform any validations, authorizations, whatever else it is required, and issue that certificate and keep it up to date within the bounds that you can define on that certificate or even on the issuer itself, saying renew this certificate before uh, 30 days before uh, it expires or 10 days, or say I want the certificate to be valid for 20 days only, whatever else it is. And, uh, with the ACME case, as you'll see in a second, we also define some extra config there um, on how to solve it, so whether or not I want HTTP or DNS. Um, so this here is an example uh, referencing that CA issuer we saw earlier. Uh, so we have our secret name. So the ultimate end goal of Cert Manager is you say, I want a certificate that looks like this. Uh, we will ultimately give you a secret, a Kubernetes secret resource with that uh, signed key pair within it. Um, so that is kind of the bound, because we often get people asking why my Nginx controller isn't now serving with a certificate. That isn't, that's kind of a step beyond. We deal with getting your, your signed certificate into a secret. So we have a secret name field. Um, and you can see here we have a common name, DNS name, so these are our subject alternative names. And we can continue to add more and more to this resource. Um, there's quite a few pull requests out there to do just that. And here we have another example, very similar, um, of requesting a certificate from an ACME issuer. Now, for ACME, we do need a few extra bits of configuration. So right now, that's defined in line on the certificate block. Um, and this will tell it to go and validate these two domains by using the uh, ingress class Nginx. So it will go and create ingress resources, similar to how Cube Lego did, um, in order to solve that validation. And we can configure it all here. In future, if this becomes cumbersome for users to actually define, we can actually come up with ways to automatically default this kind of configuration. Um, we are going for a flexible API first, and then from there, provide optimizations and things on top to make this simpler and easier to consume, which you'll see shortly. Um, yeah, on my next slide. So, simplifying all of this, because it's nice and everything, it's good to have this flexibility, but it can become painful to, I mean, you've got the same list of domains twice. It makes sense from a technical standpoint, but from a developer's standpoint, they just had to write their domains twice, and that's not ideal. So we want to simplify that complexity. And this is, was really a big key thing that had to happen um, in order to migrate these KubeLego users, because they're not used to uh, having to define all of this different type of configuration. So. Um, we built this little part uh, component of Cert Manager called Ingress Shim. This was just before KubeCon North America in December. Um, because many users do just want a Let's Encrypt certificate. They, we don't want to alienate these users. If we do, people will stay with KubeLego. We'll have to continue maintaining and putting new features into that if they do that. Um, so we need to provide a seamless transition um, across. And actually, there is a large body of users who just want secure ingresses. They don't want all of these extra features that I'm touting today. Um, so, yeah, we have an extra controller that watches all ingress resources, similar to how Cube Lego did. And when it sees certain annotations on those ingress resources, it will go along and go and create a corresponding certificate resource. So we're not reinventing Cert Manager again just to do this one thing. It's a simple kind of controller pattern. We watch ingresses, we go and create certificates. And if you update your ingress, we'll go and update that certificate. And then further down the line, Cert Manager will then pick up that configuration and maybe reissue your certificate or whatever's appropriate. So you no longer have to think about how you create those certificate resources. You create your ingress and say, I just want this signed. Um, yeah, secured, I should say. And yeah, 
it's nice, easy to use, and it simplifies things. You're no longer having to explain this. And when you do need to debug, you can fall back to that. You can just describe your resources still and see the events coming through. Um, and yeah, it means we can do this. So this, any Cube Lego user may have seen, it means we can just add this annotation on um, to our standard ingress resource and everything else happens. We'll see shortly. And yeah, sorry, this is what gets created um, off the back of it. So from here, this is all your user needs to deal with. In the API server, this is what gets created. And that can be automatically configured with defaults as configured by your administrator or by users. So I've talked a lot. Someone told me I should have done the demo at the beginning. Who knows? We'll never know. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate how you can actually use all of this to get wildcard certificates, which is a new feature in um, Let's Encrypt. You can get wildcard certificates for your ingress resources without any extra configuration. It's just the same as you did with Cube Lego. So this is demo gods because I'm doing this live on conference Wi-Fi. Um, so first things first, um, in order to do this, I am going to be, let me know if this is a bit small. Um, in order to do this, because this is part of our alpha release, um, which will be um, graduating very soon um, of 0.3, I need to install Cert Manager, first of all, using the Helm chart in the repository. So here I do a Helm using Helm. Um, so whilst that's going. Here I've done a Helm install. Um, I've specified some defaults here as well. So I've said, use the issuer Let's Encrypt Prod as a default, so if I don't know, what issue are you, if you haven't specified explicitly which issuer to use on an ingress, use this one named Let's Encrypt Prod. It's a cluster issuer. And also, use the DNS01 challenge provider and my configured Cloudflare account um, in order to do that. And we'll see that short, uh, just here. We have our issuer named Let's, uh, cluster issuer named Let's Encrypt Prod. And here I've configured an Acme server, email address, a private key, um, and I've enabled HTTP01 and configured one single DNS01 provider, which is my Cloudflare account. And you see here, we give it a name, and that's the same name as we've configured as a default, so everything should just pick up. And yeah, my API key has already been created in the API. So I can go along, kubectl create, um, kubecon slash issuer. Wi-Fi is holding up. And now I can describe my cluster issuers. And we can see here, the Acme account was registered with the Acme server. So we have a standard, easy way to, de to debug what's going on and get an idea of what's happening here. This can improve as well the way that we render this information with some new features coming in Kubernetes 1.11. Um, and yeah, I won't go too much into it because I'll run out of time. So we've got that. Um, now I'm going to deploy my little demo application, um, which is Nginx, in case anyone's never heard of it. Um, so kubectl create once again. Deployment. Great. Um, just make sure that's running. Excellent. And actually in the background, um, oh no, I haven't created my ingress yet, so that's up and running. Great. And I now want to go and create my ingress. And here, I've got a uh, domain name, kubernetes.today. I went on a buying spree of all Kubernetes-related things. So we're going to get a wildcard certificate for this. I will quickly check I'm not going to cheat and um, make sure I haven't already got a wildcard certificate for this. I was testing this all out this morning. Nope, good, cool. Um, so I'm now going to go ahead and create this ingress. And what we'll see in the background happening, uh, what we should hopefully see is a certificate resource being created four seconds ago. So that doesn't mean our certificate actually exists yet. If I do a get secret again, it's going to, oh, oh, wrong namespace. It's already issued. Um, brilliant. OK, um, so if I do here, kubectl describe certs, you can see, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, that is correct. I probably want to change this. We can see here it's gone along. It's uh, created a new order with at the Acme server. It's attempted to validate that. Um, it's validated it. It's then gone along and issued the certificate, obtained it, and put it into uh, the secret resource. So it's kind of uneventful, really, this demo, um, because it just 
worked, but that's good, right? Um, and you can see here, uh, we've got status conditions that say, you know, type ready, true. Admittedly, this is inverted. This is, as I said, the alpha release. I think I'm probably going to change this one because it looks like it's failed when it hasn't. Um, type validation failed is false, so it means it didn't fail. Um, <laughs> made sense in my mind at the time, but the nice message is here. It does say order validated. And we can go along now, and you should also all be able to do this yourself, kubecon.kubernetes.today, and there we go. And we can quickly check this out, and we'll see, if you can see, I can't make this any bigger, we have a wildcard certificate, and that's valid until the 1st of August, which is around 90 days. And that's about it. This is a very uneventful demo, because it, it worked. Um, but that's exactly what we wanted. And <laughs> Um, yeah, and as you can see, it's just using exactly the same configuration surface that we used with Cube Lego, but with all these new features. And this obviously works. If I didn't have an asterisk, we could have just gone for a standard domain. That works just fine too. We can have multiple domains, we can have whatever else. And if we adjust this, Ingress Shim, this one little component of Cert Manager, will go and update that certificate resource and everything else kicks off. So great, we have new features, they're easy to use, um, and it all works. Brilliant. Now I need to get back to my slides. Cool. So what's next um, in Cert Manager? I'm wrapping up now. Um, first of all, de defining policy on these issuers. So there, anyone can go and get a certificate for any domain in my Cloudflare account. I want to be able to define policy, so who can do it? Um, that's the first thing. And also kind of what has to be on a certain resource, uh, what, has, what a certificate has to have. So maybe a required key usage or a required expiry date or something like that. Um, advanced resource validation. So this is one thing people, if anyone uses any kind of CRD operator, they might have seen. Um, if you go and create an invalid resource, sometimes bad things can happen. We want this to feel very native. So we've got some work to actually add a validating webhook, um, if anyone's heard of them, to make that just a seamless user experience. Um, things like a slash approve endpoint, so you can then start using RBAC to constrain who can approve certificate requests within your organization. And we can then set up things like auto approvers if required. Um, there's been talk of a gRPC issuer interface, so right now, as I say, we support CAs, uh, the CA issuer, Acme and Vault. People sometimes have internal systems for this sort of thing. Maybe you want to send off an email because you'll want to use all these nice stuff, but with a team of people behind it. I don't want to do that, but that's exactly it. Maybe having some kind of a pluggable issuer interface so someone else can bring it along and they get all the other features of Cert Manager with their own CA. Um, potential integration with Istio, so they have their own component, Istio CA, uh, which issues certificates to secure their mesh. There's looking at it, I think Cert Manager is well poised to actually be a drop-in replacement for that component potentially, um, and that means you can actually see or well, get better insight into what's going on. Um, within the mesh and within that CA, standardized. Uh, there's been some talk about using it for uh, renewing CubeAdams self-hosted TLS certificates. Um, I've not tested it yet, which is why it's on the roadmap, uh, but I think it should just work uh, using the CA issuer so you can keep your self-hosted certificates up to date. And also integration with Kubernetes system components like webhooks, which creates a bootstrap problem for point two, um, but yeah. Uh, so we can actually start securing other Kubernetes components for other extension developers too. And Vault issuer support's been crossed off because, as I said, it was merged yesterday, so great. Um, so yeah, in summary, uh, we've had 38 contributors. This is becoming a real community project. I'm really proud of that. Um, we have 834 commits. I forgot to put it on here. We hit 1,000 stars. Um, that was a couple of days ago, um, just before KubeCon, and we're up to 11 releases, and I'll be doing another release um, later today with the Vault support. Uh, shameless plug, we are obviously hiring, probably like everybody else um, here. Um, so if you're interested in this sort of thing, you know, shout, come and say hello. Um, yeah, if anyone, there's been some talk about having a bit of an informal development meeting um, at some point today, so if anyone is interested, you want, you've got more questions, like roadmap related, or you want to get involved in a particular area, or if you've used Cert Manager and something's painful, um, kind of express that, shout at me. Um, yeah, 
If you want to hang around at the end, I'm thinking maybe go over to some of the tables over there so we can have a bit of a discussion um, about it. Maybe move it to lunch, but let's discuss. Out of interest, because I'm about to finish, um, who is, who's already used Cert Manager? Cool, nice. Um, awesome, well, thank you for coming along. Um, I hope you learned what you wanted to learn from this, talk, this session, um, and yeah, thank you. I don't know if I've got time for questions. Looks like I've got five and a half minutes for questions, so um, yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, I'll repeat it out. Yeah. Uh, so, is this the main? Uh, well, firstly, thank you for your talk. Is it the main that you demonstrated uh, is publicly available or in a private domain? The Kubernetes Today domain, uh, you know, that's one that I own, it's in my Cloudflare account. It is publicly accessible though, yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so my colleagues uh, have some issues with uh, the manager for some kind of private domains. Maybe they are doing something wrong, maybe it's by design. Yeah. Is it possible to use the manager for private domains? So the question there is, is it possible to use this for private domains? Um, so with the DNS validation, provided your root DNS zone is publicly available, um, or a root DNS zone is publicly available um, and authoritative, it should work just fine. You should be able to use a DNS, the DNS challenge mechanism to do that. Um, it'll update your public name servers, uh, and Let's Encrypt will then be able to hit that and retrieve the TXT record in order to validate it. You wouldn't be able to use HTTP validation, obviously, because these are private, but yeah. Um, let me come and chat and we can try and dig into what's up there. Hey. Uh, what DNS providers do you support? Good question. Um, what DNS providers do we support? Um, we've got about five or six at the minute. We're basically cherry picking them from the um, Zenelf slash Lego library for anyone who's looked into it. So it's pretty easy for us to add DNS providers in. Um, it's Google Cloud DNS, Cloudflare, I think a Akamai the other day, um, Route 53. We've got a nice documentation site um, on here, which should go into details. Uh, but yeah, so we have a list of them. It's pretty easy for us to add new ones, though. So create an issue. We've got about five more in the works, too. Good question. So if someone goes along and modifies that TLS secret, either removing a key or maybe replacing it with a new one, Cert Manager will then observe that change. What it does every time um, it observes any kind of a change is it just validates the certificate is valid for the desired certificate state. And if it isn't, it will then trigger the reissuance flow. Um, so yeah, it will switch back, basically. Yeah, so we don't have a huge number of extensions on there right now. Um, ultimately, though, there is one point in the code where we take a certificate spec and convert it into a CSR. So the addition of extra fields is fairly simple. Um, yeah, I can't remember if I repeated the question. What other fields do we support was the question. Yeah? Can I still, or can I do um, like SSL offloading on one central load balancer? Yeah, so as I said, uh, can we do SSL offloading with this was the question. Um, as I said before, kind of we basically put the secret, uh, the certificate into a secret resource. So if you're using the GCE ingress controller, for example, that will take that secret resource and it will go and send it to Google Cloud um, and then you get your SSL offload. So we don't deal with actually encrypting your traffic. We deal with getting certificates. Encrypting your traffic or how you consume those certificates is kind of a separate concern, so your ingress controller is concern, really, for the ingress case. So yes, we do support SSL offload, but you will need to write something or your ingress controller needs to go and take that secret and put it in the appropriate place.
Okay, so I think the question there is, um, with Cube Lego, it was often recreating a private key uh, for every time it renewed or issued a certificate. So um, I didn't actually realize that in Cube Lego, first of all. Um, I'm also not going to fix it. Um, but Cert Manager I do know does, if there's already a TLS.key in that secret, it will use that to go and you know, sign the CSR. So you should be happy there. there any other questions? Yeah, so the question there is, once that secret updates, um, do we have a best practice, like a recommended method for actually kicking your pod to say, you know, sig up or reload? Um, it's a good question. I would say no, whilst I'm on stage. I don't have a best practice for it. Um, a lot of people obviously use it with ingress controllers, which are using some kind of a watch, um, and they do it. You do have now shared PID namespaces, which is new in Kubernetes, and you could probably use that. Just have a little watcher that does something and fires a signal. Um, but yeah, I don't have a, a GitHub link to send you, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, I think we're probably out of time now. Um, but yeah, I'll be around here, and if anyone does want to discuss future plans or get involved with the development, then come say hello, and we'll work out a time.